Well, hello everybody. Good to see you. We're a bit thin on the ground today, but it's uh, it's good to see you still, um, every one of you. Uh, I'm David Hendricks. I'm the uh, assistant minister here. Pleasure to have you with us. To all who are weary and desire rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who question and seek answers, and to all who sin and need a savior. This church opens her doors wide and welcomes you heartily in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus calls us to worship him with these words from Psalm 148, from verses 7 and 13. Praise the Lord from the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth. Sorry, earth and heaven. Let us pray together. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your generosity. Your generosity is shown to us in so many different ways. You have uh, created and then given to us the houses we live in. Uh, the food that we eat, the clothes we wear, uh, our, our families, our friends, our, our, our work, work to give us employment, to earn money, and to earn a living. Um, you have given us rain and sun. You have given us uh, the seasons. You have given us uh, a Sabbath day of rest. Lord, for all these things, we thank you. But we thank you most of all for the one gift that you have given us that eclipses all of these. Indeed, um, like, like the rising sun, all the stars of the other gifts that you have given us disappear in comparison with the great gift that you have given us. That is, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. We give you thanks for him. Thank you for his life, death, and resurrection for us. Thank you that he has reconciled us to you. And so, Lord, accept now our worship, which is given to you this evening through the mediation of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. We stand as we're able to sing our first hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King.
hand over now to Simon to give us our notices. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our service. Richard, excellent. Um, good evening, AS, and welcome to our service uh, here at, uh, at uh, Grove Chapel. The notices for the uh, incoming week uh, are um, as, uh, as follows. I'm on uh, Wednesday morning at little f uh, 10 o'clock, the uh, Little Fishes uh, Parent Carer Toddler Group will, uh, will meet. And on uh, Wednesday evening, we will meet uh, for our house groups. So please uh, check up with your house group leader where your house group is uh, meeting um, this particular week. Our uh, next Saturday uh, morning, this Saturday morning, um, is uh, our parenting talk by uh, Anne uh, Benton. Um, and it's still too not too late to, uh, to plan to, um, to be here, to uh, um, um, plan to, uh, to be a, uh, a helper if, uh, um, um, if that's uh, more appropriate to, uh, to your circumstances and for all of these things, please speak to, um, to Ruth uh, Hewlett. Um, further and for, uh, ahead, um, there, our annual church meeting will be on uh, April the, uh, the 25th and uh, um, some of us uh, have, um, have reports and it uh, would be good to have it in the calendar as to when your report is, uh, um, is, is ready. Um, there was an email to parents of secondary age uh, children from uh, David and uh, a reply to it from the appropriate parents is uh, earnestly uh, um, and, uh, and urgently uh, sought concerning a young people's event at the IPC church in Ealing this coming Saturday. Did you get replies from everybody? We did. Oh, well, there we are. Um, and uh, finally, uh, in uh, two weeks' time, uh, our preacher will be uh, uh, Gordon Bull, who is uh, well known to uh, um, us uh, as a, uh, a congregation, and um, it is uh, appropriate to celebrate that with a uh, church uh, lunch uh, together. Um, so please uh, put that uh, in your diary that... Uh, um, for that particular Sunday, uh, plan to be uh, here in the uh, in the back hall. Um, I should ask myself the question: Is that a bring and share lunch, or one which is organised um, by uh, um, the catering committee? I look at Mr. It's a bring and share one. There we go. Yes, uh, there will be fantastic, fantastic victuals um, on that uh, on that occasion. Here ends the notices. Thank you, Simon, very much for that. Uh, turn then in your Bibles, we come to God's Word, to uh, Genesis chapter 1, on page 1. Hear then God's uh, word to us from Genesis chapter 1, reading till uh, third verse of chapter 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. 
and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's now uh, come together for our pastoral prayer, And, and just as I pray just so you can follow along in your hearts a bit more easily. I'll just be paraphrasing the Lord's Prayer so you know where I'm going. So, let's come to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that you are our Father, 
that you have adopted us into your family, that we are your sons and your daughters. We give you thanks that that is only possible because of Jesus. He is the son by nature, and, and, and in him, we have become sons and daughters by adoption. And so we do give you thanks for that relationship that we can have with you as our Father, all the while respecting you because you are great and glorious, the one who is enthroned in heaven. Father, we do pray that your name would be glorified, that it would be set apart as holy, this precious and valuable thing. We do pray, Lord, just generally that you would be glorified on people, but also then that your name that we carry around as Christians would be cause for people to glorify you. Please help our lives to be lives so, um, so compellingly good and true and beautiful that others see it and hallow your name because of it. Father, you are our Father. You are also a King. And we do pray that your kingdom would come. Thank you that it, it broke in when your son became incarnate and lived among us. And we do pray for its final completion when your son comes again. Father, we do pray that your kingdom would come not only in our own hearts, that the parts of us that have, do, do not yet bow the knee to you would, would be broken down, that you would help us to fight our sin and to kill our sin, to put it to death, so that we would live with you. Help, Lord, please be king of all of our lives. But also, also, Lord, we pray for those who do not know you, whether they are near, you know, in living in London or far off across the world. We do pray that your kingdom would come, that your gospel would advance, and that more and more people would bow the knee to Jesus Christ, their king. And Father, Lord, please would your will be done. As we kill our sin on the negative side, positively, would we live for you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Father, we, we, we are upset that we do not do your will as we would like to do. And Father, we acknowledge that the angels in heaven do it perfectly. And we long to obey your will as they do. Oh, Father, help us. Would your will be done in us? And then also then, Lord, on earth, would more and more people follow you and do your will? Father, please give us the things that we need each and every day just to get by. Give us today our daily bread. Father, we look to you for everything, not only for the food on our table, for the money in our bank accounts, Lord, but for our very existence. We depend on you. And Father, sometimes we don't actually acknowledge that. Sometimes we just kind of pretend like we're self-sufficient. Father, we are not. Oh, we need you. How we need you. And so please, help us to continue to live in conscious dependence on you for our every need. And Father, we come to you as sinners, and so we do ask you to forgive us our debts. Lord, when we come before you, we, we are lacking. We have broken your law. We have strayed. We've gone astray. And we ourselves are twisted, perverse, and crooked. We're not how we're supposed to be. Oh, Father, please forgive us. Please forgive us. And we do thank you that you are our merciful Father. And that actually, if you were not a Father, we might not, uh, we might not be able to rely or assume on your love for us. But because you are a Father, we know that our relationship is founded on love. And so we come to you and we embrace the forgiveness that you offer us. Oh, Lord, it's an odd feeling to come to you as sinners and to be so freely forgiven. But thank you that that is exactly how it is. And Lord, would that forgiveness that you extend to us oh so freely help us to forgive those who have sinned against us? 
Oh Lord, help us to be a forgiving people. Would we forgive others as you in Christ have forgiven us? And then, Lord, having forgiven us of our sin, oh, lead us not into temptation. Help us to fight the battles. Since, sins, um, since, uh, since power has been broken, since its penalty has been paid for, Lord, help its power to be completely broken in our lives. Lord, it still holds sway. There is still a cleanup operation going on, and we are weak sometimes in temptation. Help us to watch and pray and to cling to you. Oh, Lord, lead us not into temptation, and ultimately deliver us from the evil one, that great enemy of your sheep, Satan, Lord, deliver us from him, save us from him. We thank you that ultimately he is a defeated foe, but in the meantime, gird us with strength, give us the the, 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 the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of salvation, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel of peace that run into the world. Help us to fight against Satan. Put out his fiery darts. Deliver us from him. Because, Lord, yours is the kingdom. That's why we can pray that your kingdom comes. Yours is the power. That's why we can pray that your will be done. And yours is the glory. That's why we can pray that your name be, be hallowed, be set apart, be glorified. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Glory be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. We now come to uh, our next song. We'll be singing a few verses from Psalm 50. Please stand as you're able when the music begins.
turn then in your Bibles to our New Testament reading. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 34. That's on page 1116. Hear then God's word to us. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, that's Timothy and Silas. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek after God and perhaps feel their way towards Him and find Him. Yet He is not far from each of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring." Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone and an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed." And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about all this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagus. Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is God's word to us. Thanks be to God for his word. Now, uh, turn back then in your Bibles uh, to the Genesis 1 reading. We'll spend most of our time this evening in there. You remember last week we uh, maybe got up to verse 3 in Genesis 1? You'll be glad to know that today we're not even going to get past verse 1. Um, but today we're, we're looking at the question, uh, why are we fascinated with random 
acts of kindness? That's the question. It's, it's, it's part of our broader series as we consider um, uh, the beauty of a Christian perspective. So, random acts of kindness. We love them. They're heartwarming. Um, I watched uh, some good ones on YouTube this week. As uh, not, not procrastination. This isn't preparing for the sermon. Uh, the best, I think, the best ones, I think, are the ones you get on CCTV or kind of car dash cam footage because then you know that they're not staged. Yeah, there's a few that are clearly fake. Uh, let me give you some examples of, of, of random acts of kindness I saw this week on, on, on YouTube. There was one, um, there was a man with a, a trolley full with fruit, I think kind of plums or something, I'm not quite sure. The trolley spills over and suddenly these plums just kind of go rolling everywhere. And in the background, there's this family of young children and the kind of children see it, and they chase. And these kind of guys are like primary school or younger, and they start picking up the, the, all these kind of pears and giving them back to the man. It's that kind of heartwarming you know, moment where this man's like, oh, all this fruit is everywhere, and these young children come and help him. It's a kind of sweet moment. Another one I saw, this is, this is a kind of classic one. You see this kind of kind lots. Um, someone sprinting towards uh, this elderly person who is unaware that a lorry is about to reverse into them and then grabbing them out of the way just at the last second. Random acts of kindness, we, we, we love them. We love them because there's, there's no sense in which you know, the man with the trolley or the old lady uh, deserved them. But there is a far greater random act of kindness that I want to uh, consider tonight before we return to that question of why we are so fascinated by them. The far greater random act of kindness, it goes to the very core of our existence, and the random act of kindness I'm talking about today is you. It's this whole universe, the fact that you exist. Why is our existence a random act of kindness? Well, look at Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me just make one observation there. This is the main observation that we make tonight. The universe had a beginning. The universe began to exist. Now, as we saw last week, if we compare that to God, remember we said God just is? God never began to exist. He, he, just, he just is. There was one uh, brilliant church member that put it. Um, uh, God is forever now, forever now. He, it just is. He was absolute. That's what we called it. Um, if I could quote uh, from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, that Spaghetti Western, uh, there are two types of people in this world, those with the loaded guns and those who dig. You dig. Um, in the same way, if we want to divide up existence into two types of people, it's those who began to exist and those who didn't. But the category of that who, of the, the, the one who did, never began to exist is just God, right? That is, that is the most fundamental distinction that can possibly be made. There is a God who just is, who never began to exist, and then there is us and everything that began to exist. We had a beginning. And all I want to do tonight is just consider three uh, significant consequences from the fact that the universe had a beginning. Three consequences that the universe had a beginning. And we'll take them with three Gs. Gratuity, grace, and gratitude. Gratuity, grace, gratitude. Let's take that first one then, gratuity. If the universe has a beginning, it is gratuitous. Gratuitous. Now, normally when we use that word gratuitous, when I think about it, it would probably be describing films. You might say, there were, I watched that film, but there was a lot of gratuitous violence. Yeah, there's lots of um, blood, guts, and gore. And you might say, we, we didn't need to see all that, that gore. It was surplus to requirement. Or maybe you watch a film and you say, there was, there was a lot of gratuitous nudity. You know? now, obviously, as a Christian perspective, nudity is, nev is always gratuitous. But you know, sometimes you watch things where violence or nudity or whatever it is, you go, that did not help the plot move along in any way. You just kind of chucked it in there. 
gratuitous. That's what it means. Surplus to requirement. We didn't need to see it. We didn't need it. It, it was not necessary. Now, in a similar way, we are gratuitous. We could have not been. If we began to exist, it's very possible that we didn't. The universe could always just not have existed. We are gratuitous. We did not need to exist. God did not need us. God did not need us. Well, then the question comes, well, why, why did God create us then? If God did not need us, if we are in, in one sense surplus to requirement, why did God create at all? Before I answer that question, I actually just want to sit in the gratuitiness of our existence. I want to make us feel that question a little bit harder. Why did God create us? By comparing uh, Genesis with uh, another account from the ancient Near East. Um, so in Genesis, a few chapters later from chapter 1, you, you get the flood account. You know, Noah's flood, I imagine most of you will be familiar with that quite well. Now, m most, if not all, and, and maybe actually all, ancient Near Eastern cultures have a flood myth, have a flood narrative. And I want to just compare Genesis's one with uh, one from ancient Mesopotamia called the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh. This is a great name. In the Bible's story of the flood, uh, after the flood, Noah offers a sacrifice. And it only says, uh, here, I'm just quoting from Genesis 8, 21, it says, the Lord smells the pleasing aroma. And then it just moves on and God makes a covenant and so on. That, that, that's all you hear about the sacrifice. God, Noah makes a sacrifice and the Lord smells the pleasing aroma and we move on. It's, it's, there's almost nothing to see here, but actually that's quite significant. The fact that there is nothing to see here is very significant. Compare that with the flood story from the Epic of Gilgamesh. So again, after the flood, the, the Noah character, who, who was called Uta, Utanapishtim, Utanapishtim he, he's the Noah guy, he also makes a sacrifice. And then it says this, listen to this. The gods smelled the savor. The God smelled the sweet savor and collected like flies over a sheep sacrifice. The idea is that they are swarming to this sacrifice. Why? Because in the epic of Gilgamesh, the gods needed to feed on the sacrifices. All the humans were dead because of the flood, right? And so not sacrifices, no sacrifices. So as soon as Utanapishtim, that the Noah figure, makes a sacrifice, suddenly all the gods are going like, oh, yes, yes, give me, give me, give me, swarming like flies, because they're really hungry. But do you notice how that is completely absent in Genesis? In Genesis, God smells it, smells nice, and then gets on with the business of making a covenant with Noah. God does not need Noah's sacrifice. That's just another way of and pressing into it, the, the fact that God does not need us. God did not need us to do sacrifices to feed him like in the, the ancient Mesopotamians thought. So why did God create then if he doesn't need our sacrifices? Well, ah, may, maybe God's lonely. Maybe God's lonely. Oh, maybe he needed a bit of company. Well, no. Remember what we said last week. God is a trinity. He's already in the best loving relationship with himself that could possibly be. And actually, just as a side point, so many of you last week asked me, David, why did you not mention Allah? The reason was I just completely didn't think to mention Allah. But this would be a good comparison here. Allah is a strict nomad. He, he is just merely one being. He is not a trinity. So you can't really say the same. I don't think about Allah. But here, I can, you can clearly say from the Christian perspective, God is not lonely. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing in all happiness and love at sort of 100% levels for all time, like, not even for all time, outside of time, God did not need creation because he was lonely either. So why did God create? He doesn't, he doesn't need us to kind of give him food. He doesn't need us to keep him company. Why did God create? And the answer, the answer can only be love. The answer can only be love. If God is Trinity and exists in those three relations, at the heart of who God is, is love. 
That's at the heart of who he is. And so God creates not out of need, but out of love. Not out of loneliness, but out of love. Gratuitous love. Gratuitous love. We did not need to be. We did not need to exist. We only exist because God is so loving, he made something else for him to love. Not because he needed it, but because love is always directed outward. If the universe has a beginning, it is gratuitous. We are gratuitous. We are the, we are the result of God's gratuitous love. Second point then, grace. If the universe has a beginning, it is based on grace. You see, when we say, when I, when we say gratuitous love, as Christians, we just more regularly call that grace. And the emphasis in that word grace, as I'm sure many of you will know, is on it being undeserved. It's on, it's on it being undeserved. But this is interesting. This is interesting because if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you'll have kind of picked up that we don't often talk about grace in connection with creation. Normally, we talk about grace in connection with salvation, you know, being saved. Let me, let, me kind of, let me just explain that a little bit, and then we'll see the significance of it. So, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. Two more implications for you there, two implications here. Firstly, if God created everything, um, that means he owns everything. God creates it, he owns it. We know that that's, that's co copyright. You know, copyright is that thing. You know, I made this song, I own it. Yeah? If I made or invented something, I own it. If you create it, you own it. God owns it. Right? But then also, second implication, if God created everything, it also means that he sets the rules. If he creates it, he sets the rules. Let me illustrate that one for you. Um, when I was in year, no, in, in, in reception or nursery, one of the two, I can't remember, I went to Langdale Primary School. And on the playground in Langdale Primary School, there, is a, there was a gate. And me and my friend Benjamin, we made up a game. And the idea of the game, and the rules of the game were the gate, the school gate is, is kind of, is, that's base, that's safe. And what we'd do is we would go running to the year, girls in the year above us, annoy them enough, until they came and chased us, and we'd run back, and if you got to the gate in time, then you were safe, you were on base, and you weren't caught. And that was, you know, do it again, go, annoy these girls, they chase us, and if they catch us, I guess we lose or something, and then, or whatever, but then back to the gate, and that's it, just back and forth, back and forth. That's the game, and those are the rules. Now, we made the game, we set the rules until we came out one playtime, and my eldest sister came to play with us because what had happened was one of the year six girls had taken over our game. She'd taken over the gate, and loads of people were there, and she was making her own rules. And so my sister very kindly just went, and we went to the climbing frame, and we, that playtime, we just were on the climbing frame because our game was taken over. But that was wrong. You see, we made the game. We set the rules. And it's the same with God. He made the world. He sets the rules. Now, with these two implications, from the fact that God created everything, so that means, um, firstly, he owns everything, secondly, he sets the rules, we see how that makes sense of sin. Yeah, do you see that? Because God created me, God owns me, and God sets the rules that I have to follow. So when I don't follow the, those rules, that's called sin. And all of us humans have broken God's rules at some point. And, and, and pretended that, you know, we own ourselves. But what makes God wonderful is this thing called grace. His gratuitous love for us, his undeserved love towards us. We don't deserve that love. Remember, we've rejected him. We've broken the rules. But by grace, in his son Jesus, God saves us from sin. That's what Good Friday and Easter Sunday are all about. Uh, so make sure you come along to those services at the end of the month. But that, that's what grace is, and that's how we normally think about grace. We broke the rules, we pretended we own ourselves, but God steps in with grace and saves the day. 
But that means that, the, the, that we're used as Christians to hearing this order. Sin, then grace. That's kind of how we work. We think of sin and then grace. That's the order we expect to receive from God. Sin, then grace. But what the gratuity of creation does is it shows us that the order is different. The order that we experience God is not sin, then grace, but grace, then sin, then grace. The grace of creation, then sin, and then the grace of salvation. Do you see that grace is already primed at creation? It's already ready to go. And, and so when we come to God, the first thing we come is, is not to a conviction of sin, but to grace. Grace comes first. Grace of creation. Christopher Watkin, um, who wrote a book called Biblical Critical Theory, uh, says this. We encounter this grace, not first in redemption, but in creation. It is through grace that the Christian is born again, but it is also through grace that the universe is born in the first place. So, like, how does that make you feel to think that the first movement of God towards you is not conviction of your sin, but grace? The first thing we experience from God isn't condemnation, but grace. Grace sets the tone for the whole relationship. Do, do you realize that God comes first to you with grace? Like, yes, He convicts you of your sin, you know, but only after He has graciously created you into loving existence. Yeah? Sin, is, sin isn't this kind of the barrier that you have to get through to get to God's nice stuff. You, you start with that. You start with sin. Sorry, start with grace. That's what we encounter first with God. Then we discover that we're sinners because God graciously convicts us of sin. And then we have the grace of, of redemption, that grace of forgiveness. But it's, it, it's top and tailed by grace. If the universe has a beginning, it is based on grace. And then thirdly, gratitude. If the universe has a beginning, it inspires gratitude. So if creation is gratuitous, if it was gracious of God to create, then creation is a gift. Creation is a gift. Our existence itself is a gift. And if there's a gift, there's a giver. Our creator is that giver. Again, Christopher Watkin uh, says, the giver is usually thanked. So our fundamental orientation to existence in light of gratuity is one of praise and thanksgiving. If creation is a gift, we should be grateful. We should be grateful. There's a song um, uh, by a guy called Andrew Peterson, singer-songwriter, has done lots about kind of Christians in the arts and stuff. I recommend it. He's written a song called, Don't You Want to Thank Someone? Don't You Want to Thank Someone for This? Uh, and I mean, a lot of the song was quotable here, but I'll just quote one little bit. Um, he says, don't you ever wonder why, in spite of all that's wrong here, there's still so much that goes so right and beauty abounds. Let me give you uh, some, maybe some different examples of that. One, most of you know, we, we live in Lee Green, that direction, uh, and at the end of our road, there is uh, Manor House Gardens, and there's a pond in Manor House Gardens. Now, I quite like a bit of bird watching, uh, but, and the birds that you'll see there, every time you go there, you know, you've got gray herons, there's one swan, some Canadian geese, tufted duck, mallard, Moorhen, coot, black-headed gull, and a few of us that I'm forgetting. And you see them every time, and so they get a little bit boring. But, but, if you are lucky, and you catch the right moment, and you're not blinking in that moment, you'll see a kingfisher. This dash 
of electric blue going, you know. And if you're lucky, you'll actually see him sitting on a branch somewhere, and you'll see not only the electric blue, but this kind of bright orange of his front. And, it, and it's precious, and almost I think it's more precious because it's harder to find. You know, like, you know, the herons you see every time, the swan you see every time, they're great, they're beautiful, they are glorious, but, but the kingfisher, that, that's a real treat if you're walking in the park and you catch the kingfisher. Ah, there he is. Yeah? And that, that kind of moment of, wow. You know, and, and, you, and then you're thinking, like, those dog walkers who are just walking past me right now, they don't realize what they're missing. Because I'm, I'm looking over here and seeing this kingfisher, but they're just thinking, here's this weird guy with his phone out trying to take a picture that's not going to work. That special moment, like, you know, don't you want to thank someone for this? Don't you want to thank someone for this? Or maybe kind of think of it, that's kind of, that's kind of the wonder of creation, but, but even sort of in our lives. Um, think about, like, you know, when you're having a really bad day, um, and, and, and you think, if something else goes wrong, I'm just going to start crying. And then there's this a sweet, there's a, there's a, you know, there's text on your phone from someone that's really meaningful. Um, or an example of mine, you know, we once got really, really bad news. Uh, but thankfully, it was just as I left the group that I was in. It would be really hard to get bad news in a group of those of people. And I was like, God, God, this bad news is horrible. But like, thank you that at least I got it when I, after I'd left. A little, a little subtle thing. God didn't have to do that. I could have got the bad news right in the middle of this group I was in. But just a subtle, like, thank you, God. Even in the midst of all this pain, that was kind of you, you know? And, and maybe if you're not a Christian here tonight or online, maybe, I don't know, do you get that feeling sort of, if I believed in God, I would thank him right now? There's, there's sometimes... It's the world we live in just provokes this thankfulness, and we don't quite know what to do with it. But that, that, is, that is at the heart of our world. It, our world is gratuitous. It's a gift. And what do you do with gifts with thankful? You, you, you say thank you for them. But notice that this gratitude isn't just with our words, but also with our actions, there's a wonderful prayer uh, written by a man called Edward Reynolds who was around in the 1600s. Uh, if it means anything to you, he was one of the Westminster divines and then later was Bishop of Norwich. And he has this, this praying to God, give us that due sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful and that we show forth your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. There's lots there, but did you hear that phrase, not only with our lips, but in our lives? It's a nice little phrase just to remember. That's what, that's what thankfulness looks like. It's not only with our lips, but in our lives. And so when Christians behave morally, uh, which they should, and, and I'm genuinely sorry if Christians have behaved cruelly to any of you, but when Christians behave morally, it is, it is not to make God like them, but because God already does. Yeah? Gratitude does not earn the gift that you have already been given. Yeah? And no matter how many thank you cards you might write, you know, after Christmas to someone who gave you a gift, that, ha that cannot earn the gift that you've already received. Gratitude cannot earn a gift that you've already been given. And so again, maybe to, like we spoke of orders earlier, we could do it again. The order is not moral lives and then we receive grace. It's we have received grace already, which prompts you know, moral living, that prompts a life of gratitude. It's, it's, it's grace is received and then moral thankful lives follow. So, if the universe has a beginning, it inspires gratitude. And so then just to tie it up again, let's, let's, let's just see what we've seen today. Creation is a random act of kindness. Random, it's unexpected. It was not necessary. It was out of the blue, but there wasn't even a blue that existed for it to be out of. It was completely gratuitous. Gratuitous. Creation is gratuitous. 
It comes from God's grace, and it inspires us to gratitude. And so why then, why, brothers and sisters, why are we fascinated by random acts of kindness? I think, is it maybe because it's written at the deepest level of the universe itself? It's, it's in our DNA. You can't look anywhere without seeing a random act of kindness. I'm looking at however many people in front of me now, I'm looking at however many numbers of random acts of kindness, but also that stone pillar did not need to exist. And yet it does. This pillar here, it exists. There's no reason why it needed to exist. And it does. That stone pillar, because it is created by God, is a random act of kindness. It speaks to who we are in a profound way when we think about random acts of kindness because they resonate with how we were created. We are gratuitous. We respond to that gratuitous love that is the foundation of all reality. Maybe that's part of the answer of why we are fascinated with random acts of kindness. Let me pray then as we close. Creator, Father, thank you that we exist. Lord, we did not need to exist because you are so wonderful in and of yourself, existing in triune perfection, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, you, you did not need us. And we give you thanks then that you created us out of this overflowing love. Thank you for the gratuitous Thank you for the grace that is shown to us in creation and for the grace that is shown to us in saving us from sin. And thank you for everything. And so please help us, help us to, to see this and so then to live lives full of gratitude. Gratitude as we are astounded and amazed at the gratuitous love of our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we come now to sing our final song. My heart is filled with thankfulness. I hope by the power of the Spirit, that's where we are right now. Hearts filled with thankfulness. Please stand as you're able as the music begins.
So, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.